The opening sequence of episode 26 is what for many was a very welcome recap of where we left off in season 1, because, you know, the four year wait definitely took its toll. It briefly recaps the history of the walls, something that would of course now be an even greater mystery, and repeats the now signature line of humanity being trapped like birds, something that too would be turned up to 11 with the new ED for season 2. More on that in a minute. Though as is often the case with the series, it also very quickly reframes this retelling to also function as a sort of a lead into our very next battle. Armin says that despite their successful capture of Annie, their next target would be close at hand. With the benefit of hindsight, we of course know that this is true in more ways than one, but all of them would turn out to be Annie's allies. What Armin is referring to here is probably the Beast Titan, but we also have Reiner and Bertolt about to make their move. But the point in all of this is that it begins to cement the story as a war with two very explicit sides, rather than just humanity's fight for survival as we've sort of seen so far. And broken record Kuroto also has to make a return here because keep in mind that Erwin's plan from the female Titan mission is still in motion. With almost 100% certainty, we can say that we still have someone leaking information. So yes, the next enemy is indeed fast approaching, much sooner than I think many of us expected. And on a similar note, we pick up right where we left off at the base of the wall, with Hanji and the others being completely stunned by the realization that a titan lies within. Though for her, the first question is of course, does that mean all of the walls are made up of titans? Because that is, I mean, oh boy, we calculated the territory of the walls, that is a whole lot of titans. Which naturally sparks just as many questions about how they got there, how were the walls even constructed, and so on. Though before she can even really think about it, we pick back up with Pastor Nick, who, as we saw in the season 1 finale, was absolutely mortified when Aaron and Annie were heading toward the wall. So now that he's finally made it here himself, he is simply screaming to not let the sunlight touch them. I mentioned it last time already, but pure titans are basically powered by sunlight. So obviously, he doesn't want the wall titans to suddenly awaken and basically start an uncontrolled rumbling. Because, you know, that'd be pretty bad, right? Though yeah, we will touch on this plenty more when we get to the spoiled I mean ending song. And before we get to the ending song, we need to talk about what is probably one of the greatest anime openings of all time. I mean, yeah, I don't think I really need to say anything about just how iconic the song is at this point, and while I wouldn't say it's my favorite opening song, I'd be lying if I said that I'm not covered in goosebumps whenever I hear it and have a strong urge to do the salute. Yes, I am a weirdo. Though as is often the case with Attack on Titan, it is also chock full of symbolism. We open with the serene shot of a mother holding a baby, one who I think you could easily argue to symbolize a mirror. But point is that, it is about as innocent and pure as you can get though that is then entirely subverted as the statue is just clean ripped in half. And as we zoom out, it is completely encircled by titans, immediately setting the tone for this upcoming arc. First of all, it of course reinforces the whole the world is a cruel place angle which we've heard many times before. What's more is that with the beast titans slowly coming into the picture, now more than ever, titans can and will literally just encircle us out of the blue. So I think it's just a good visual representation of just how quickly the tide of battle can turn now. Another thing that I really loved in this one is how well it pulls off the characterization of our main cast. We see everyone prepping for battle, and in a number of subtle and not so subtle ways, the series immediately shows us the dynamic of their squad. For Mikasa, we only see her put on her scarf, which, as we know, is the most important thing to her that symbolizes her connection to Eren. We see Sasha helping Connie get dressed, which again just very neatly shows us their sibling energy right away. We see Reiner gesture for them to get a move on, which again calls back to us hearing that he's a great leader. We see Hanji put on her glasses slash goggle thingies, something that has long been used to convey intelligence. We then literally stand behind Erwin just like all the scouts following him, etc etc. In like 10 seconds flat, it reminds us of who each and every one of these characters are, something that is again, probably pretty nice to have considering the four years. And we also have plenty of cheeky foreshadowing here. Like we see Astoria looking shocked, that is then directly preceded by a shot of Amir with a titan behind her. Which, you know, certainly isn't sus at all. Almost as shocking as if her best friend turns out to be a titan shifter, huh? Also, the shots of the armored here are absolutely incredible and certainly get you hyped for the inevitable clash between them. Especially with the still frame we get at the very end of Aaron standing against him, which, by the way, also chooses to depict the heart beating within both of them. 
We'll touch on this in a second, but it just continues the theme of everyone in this story having a reason for what they do. The Armored might have attacked Paradeep seemingly out of the blue, but just like Aaron, there is a heart beating inside. It might be a cruel act, but from his perspective, it is not a mindless act of violence. And in a similar vein, all the shots of the scouts we get here are absolutely incredible. Like the shot of them all dropping from the walls onto the titans literally gives me chills. And just like with Aaron and Reiner clashing, we also see the scouts all standing shoulder to shoulder with that same flame burning within their hearts. Which one obviously symbolizes the whole dedicate your heart aspect and how there's this fire burning inside all of them. And two, it potentially could also be seen as some neat foreshadowing to how the Beast Titan operates. Something we will touch on in a second. I also remember that back in the day, the shot of this baby's hand was a point of contention, as there was a split in opinion of whether or not this is purely visual symbolism, or if it's an actual character. So this time, let us leverage hindsight and get to the bottom of it. First off, I do think there's a strong case to be made that is just that. A visual representation of what we see in the story following this point. Again, a small baby holding a parent's hand is just about as pure as you can get. But a moment later, the whole scene is literally incinerated. Something that would just yet again cement the whole the world is cruel angle. Though, I also think there's a case to be made that this could be baby Aaron holding Grisha's hand, and the incineration part is that little thing called the rumbling. Something that would also back up the whole Aaron is the child of the devil angle. Though I also think there's a case to be made that this could be Zeke's hand as P2 now be coming into the picture and the whole split in Grisha's life would become very important with this arc. But I also think that considering the motherly imagery we saw at the very top of the opening, this could also be King Fritz. The man who basically started the story of parody as we know it by constructing the walls and creating the vow to renounce war. And because this almost idealistic vow would now be broken with us entering what is a very explicit war, the scene is now just completely incinerated. And yes, it is still not over, because I also think there's a case to be made that this is Historia's baby way, way into the future, and the whole it burning away is rather showcasing the sort of light at the end of the tunnel, and how even in a story as dark as Attack on Titan, there's still purity in these smaller things. Especially considering that Historia's baby in-universe can also be seen as a symbol of a new beginning, with it being born during or soon after the rumbling. So yeah, I think there are plenty of ways you can interpret this. What you can only interpret one way, though, is the shot of the scouts charging the Colossal because the only interpretation here is badass, with Mikasa pulling a Levi vs Zeke move here and charging in solo. And while that in and of itself is incredible, the shot of Mikasa grabbing Eren midair and throwing him at the armored is absolute peak. We've already seen a few shots of the scouts launching off of each other midair, so this is very much that. Just further proving that the ODM gear movement system is still unmatched in coolness factor. Though the final shots we get in this one are a series of beasts and Zeke, the beast titan, trampling people with said beasts. This opening as a whole does juxtapose the hunter and the prey quite a lot, so this could also be a way to just convey that. The world is a cruel place and so we just see the natural order of things. Hunters going after their prey. Only problem is the giraffes are herbivores, so they don't eat meat, so they're not really predators, but anyway. What I find far more interesting here is the potential foreshadowing toward the rumbling, because, you know, these are lumbering beasts trampling the world which were awakened by Zeke's scream? Now, don't get me wrong, normally I would say, surely not, right? No way that the opening of all things would foreshadow something as big as that. But, um, you know, I mean, the ending did? So, uh, yeah, this opening really slaps. As for the title of the episode, The Beast Titan, I really don't think there's much to read into here. Zeke basically kickstarts the entire season 2 to 3 story, and this is the first time he appears, so yeah, The Beast Titan. Moving into the episode itself, we once again open right where we left off in season 1, with Erwin 2 now learning of the Titans within the walls. With Erwin though, things are a little different. As unlike Hanji, who is more so stunned by the sheer number of possible explanations and the research that she can now carry out, Erwin is sort of of two minds about this. Obviously, he's just angry about this just being yet another case of someone keeping information from them for some bogus made-up reason while they're literally dying out there trying to learn anything they can. But at the same time, with what we learn of his childhood later on, he is now yet another step closer to finally confirming all of those theories his father talked about. Just like with the revelation that the female titan is just a human, there being titans within the walls just lets Erwin pin another bit of string on his corkboard, if you will. 
It might raise countless entirely new questions, but clearly, we are beginning to peel away at the layers of layers of completely unknowns. We then cut on over to Marlo and Hitch, who are on cleanup duty after the clash between Aaron and Annie. And here, we very much see how this was almost their trust and trial by fire. First off, they discuss how they're probably just going to cover all of this up, with Marlo just asking how and why. With Marlo, we've already seen how he had this dream of cleaning up the MP and ending the endless corruption we'd already seen with them. So with him now literally seeing how they're not the least bit worried about covering up something of even this magnitude, I mean, two titans literally just fought at the very heart of Walsina, for Marlo, this is just a very rude awakening of how hard of a task he has ahead of him. Though unfortunately for a mob cosplayer, we'd soon have far more pressing matters, but more on that soon. And another thing to note here is notice how Hitch's ha ha Marlo you're just a silly wannabe soldier persona is all but gone. Just a couple of episodes ago, we heard about how she joined the MPs, basically just hoping to slack off. So just like with Marlo, this is a very rude awakening for her that, with the Titan War now really heating up, there is no shroud of ignorance here, the MPs are no more safe than everyone else. And so, just like Aaron's squad back in Trost, they now find themselves also just cleaning up bodies. Cutting back to Hanji, we see her and past Shernik atop the wall, where she just desperately tries to find answers about why there are Titans within the walls. With Hanji, we of course must remember that she has spent a very good part of her life just trying to break down and understand the mechanics of the Titans. She was basically at the very cutting edge of learning how they even operate. So to her, the sudden realization that people like Pastor Nick and potentially many others already know something about not only the Titans but also how the walls were built using Titans is both a blessing as she'll finally be able to further progress her research, but also a curse in that it somewhat trivializes all of her accomplishments. You know that feeling when you spend like two hours trying to figure something out and you come up with your own janky solution? But then someone walks up and demonstrates how to do it in like two minutes in a far more simple way. Yeah, you still figured it out on your own, but I mean, come on, it does somewhat trivialize what you just did, right? And that is Hanji right now. And another thing that I found really interesting here is how Hanji is portrayed. Because she straight up threatens to throw Nick off the wall, but eventually pulls him back, saying that of course she couldn't do that. Obviously, we know that basically all of the scouts are tough as nails. So Hanji going all in on Nick is sort of exactly what we expect. But instead of her keeping up the act, because, you know, she could have thrown him back on the wall and said something along the lines of, oh, I will just let Erwin deal with you. But no, she breaks character and basically spells out that she has no intention of harming him in any way. I think subverting that emotional coldness that we would expect with the elites, and rather focusing on Hanji's curiosity about the Titans, really tells us basically everything we need to know about her. She isn't even really mad at him for keeping this secret, rather she just wants to understand why. Though my absolute best part of the sequence is the very ending moments, as she just sits down asking, so are all the walls made out of titans? And then just saying that she had almost forgotten this feeling, finishing by saying, it's pretty scary. And oh boy, I just love how unsettling the whole sequence is. This is not us losing our minds about the potential of titans being within the wall. There is no chaos among any of them. There is no brutal interrogation. It is literally just Hanji sitting down and saying, wow, this is pretty scary. And something about that just seems so, so much more uneasy than if it was made out to be some sort of huge deal. Because this is Hanji, the absolute brains of the scouts, it more so just makes us feel completely powerless. As if everything they'd worked for was only revealed to be the very tippity top of the iceberg and it's her just saying, I don't even know where to start with this. Though suddenly, just like with season 1 when Walmaria fell, we hear the bells ring out as Thomas arrives with the message of, Wall Rose has been breached. Just like we've seen many many times, it just further establishes that cyclicality of the story. At the start of Season 1, we lost Maria, and while it may not be the Colossal, Titans have clearly just appeared out of the blue, so we are starting Season 2 with losing Wall Rose. What's worse is that back in Trost, we already heard about how losing Wall Rose would basically start a timer to humanity's extinction. So this is very much a all or nothing type of battle. Though all of that is still nowhere near as important as what we see on the side of Eren's squad. We jump 12 hours earlier to see Aaron's squad who are all kept in isolation because Erwin still knows that there's a traitor among them. So, not wanting the Armored or Colossal to intervene in the Annie capturing mission, everything they did was done off the books and the rest were separated from Aaron. 
And importantly, Reiner literally points this out himself, saying that this is odd. They are forced to stay in civilian clothing, they are not allowed to arm themselves, they are being kept in some completely random remote location, but literally everyone around them is armed to the teeth. Almost as if they were trying to make sure someone doesn't escape, huh? So yeah, he may not know that they are up next for Erwin's schemes, but he has certainly picked up on the fact that something is off and they are being treated weirdly. Oh, and also, Connie and Sasha here are literally the best and describe me six days out of the week. Though a more subtle detail here that I thought was really neat is Reiner and Berthold playing chess. Which to me, seems like subtle symbolism that, unlike the rest of their squad who are bored out of their minds, they are constantly trying to think ahead. It's the usual case of everyone's playing checkers while these two are playing chess. And before you ask, yes, of course I tried analyzing their chessboard to figure out whether there's some cheeky one move away from capturing the king foreshadowing or something like that. But unfortunately, based on what we see, the board doesn't really appear to be entirely consistent and the pieces do change places between frames. Do keep in mind that I'm a mega casual chess enjoyer, but to me at least, there doesn't seem to be another deeper layer to analyze aside from the aforementioned thinking ahead implication. Though, that is only the beginning of everything, because both Mikkei and Sasha then pick up on the Titans in the area. What in hindsight seems very amusing, Mikkei says that there are likely no Titan shifters within the 104th core. Which from his point of view, yes, it makes perfect sense. Like I just mentioned, they are isolated by design and clearly none of them have transformed. So, if the walls are now breached, well, it couldn't have been the Colossal or the Armored. Little does he know, however, we'd soon be meeting another friendly old pal. And speaking of which, as we jump back to the 104th, notice Reiner's and Berthold's reactions here. Reiner is absolutely shook when he turns to Berthold to ask, does this mean the wall really has been breached? I mean, yeah, this is a shock to everyone, but compared to the rest of their squad, why is it that we so explicitly focus on him and his reaction is far more tense than scared? Well, to him, this isn't a question of, is the wall breached? To him, this is a question of, what do we do now? If the wall really is breached, then chances are Marley is attacking. We need to regroup with them. And we also need to quickly find out where Aaron is. We need to figure out what's going on with Annie. We need to inform them of just how much Paradis knows already. We need to tell them that we know Aaron has the attack titan, but we still don't know where the founder is. Basically, they have like 300 things to consider, but they just need to regroup with Marley first and foremost. Which is of course exactly what we'd see them attempt in just a second. And before I say anything else, this won't apply to a vast majority of you, but just in case, make sure you are sitting down because things are about to get wild. You ready? Look at the CGI horses. Yeah, CG. Very spooky, isn't it? Oh no! Anyway! Though a super interesting scene we get here is Nanaba and Mikkei trying to get a grasp on the situation. Earlier in Season 1, I already mentioned how to me, Mikkei's almost Jojo-like characterization of him having this super strong sense of smell is something that sticks out to me like a sore thumb. Though I really like how that wacky, goofy persona of his is entirely subverted and we finally see why he was so close to Erwin. Nanaba basically says that they're done, though Mike cuts her off saying that, no, as long as they have the will to fight, they're still in it. So yes, very much a dedicate your heart enjoyer, but we'll pick back up with them in a second, so hold that thought for now. Jumping back on over to the 104th Corp, this is where things get very, very interesting. We of course hear that the Titans are coming from the south, the same direction where Connie's village is at. With the benefit of hindsight, we of course know that it is unfortunately no longer Connie's village as Zeke and a bunch of Marley soldiers turn everyone in Ragako into Titans. But yes, point is, that is where the attack began. Naturally, Connie says that if they need to divert the Titans, he will happily take the south position because he just wants to make sure that his village is still safe. Which is cool and all, but far more importantly, Reiner then pipes up saying, yeah, you know what, I will go with Connie as well. And as if that wasn't enough, he then asks Berthold whether he'd come as well, who answers, of course I'll come. So, if this was an actual full-blown attack from Marley, yes, Reiner is very much leading Connie to slaughter, as again, their one and only goal currently is to regroup with whoever or whatever is mounting the attack on Wall Rose. And that is also a reason why Reiner would eventually break his cover on the wall. But that's like a whole different can of worms, so we'll leave that for when we get there. Jumping back on over to Mikkei, he says that he'll go off solo to buy them some time. And we also hear that his skills are only second to Levi's himself. So, somewhat unknowingly, Zeke does take out what is a massive threat to them without even breaking a sweat. 
But okay, like, Mika is cool and all, but let's be real here. You tell Mika so that Aaron's in danger, she dice him up in like two seconds flat. But okay, on a more serious note, the ODM gear scenes we get here are all just excellent. And I do think that Mika going out with an absolute bang was a deliberate choice to tell us that these characters are more than just a gimmick. Mikkei's wacky superpower might be smell, but he is more than that, because he is also an excellent fighter. And before we carry on with him, we jump on over to the eye catcher describing the titans in the walls. First off, notice how the visuals are now merging the previous ones we've already seen. Very much telling you that all of those random one-offs we saw are in fact all connected. Yes, the walls are absolutely massive. Yes, they all have titans in them. And yes, the church knows about them. So, I think there is already plenty of evidence to start thinking about whether or not this might be your potential Ragnarok event in Attack on Titan. And also, just like I mentioned last time with my explanation of the walls stretching deep down into the Earth, this is where we are also told that the walls are made of a similar material to Annie's crystal, clearly implying that they may not appear to be the same, with Annie's crystal being shiny and blue while the walls are basically concrete. But in terms of their properties, they are largely the same. And here, you can get a wee bit of tinfoil ready, because we then jump back in time to see Carla hanging out clothes while talking about how Aaron got into yet another fight. With her then asking, Mikasa came to your rescue again, didn't she? And finishing by saying that he should protect her for once, as we once again zoom in on his super detailed eyes and transition into him waking up. First of all, just like with the bells ringing out signaling the supposed fall of Wal Rose, is just another case of cyclical storytelling with us quite literally returning to where it all began before the walls fell. Secondly, this also neatly sets up Aaron avenging his mother by activating the Founder's power through contact with Dina, and both killing the Smiling Titan as well as protecting Mikasa. Though lastly, and far, far more interestingly to me, I think you could also take it to be some mild foreshadowing toward the long dream. Because, you know, Aaron did once again get into a fight. Mikasa tried coming to his rescue, but instead of stopping her with the Founder's power, he ultimately protected her by allowing her to send him back to square one. Okay, I admit that is a stretch. But it's a fixed timeline, so is it really? A smaller thing to note here that I thought was a really nice touch is Mikasa's scarf, with Aaron saying that it's in absolute tatters and that he tried to get her a new one. To us as the viewers, it of course looks perfectly fine, but I do like the extra bit of realism because, you know, she has had it for literal years. Okay, I lied, get your tinfoil ready. Because Aaron wants her to get rid of it, and you know when else he wanted her to get rid of it? Yes, before he started the rumbling. Sure seems like an odd thing to mention right after waking up, especially when you're stuck in a time loop, huh? Just saying. Jumping back on over to Mike, we see him wipe out a whole bunch of titans, but then slowing down and saying that he has bought them enough time and that there is no need to fight the rest. Which again, a nice bit of additional characterization. He is not just a really good fighter, he is also smart. He could probably take on the remaining four titans, but there is no point to exert energy if they are still unsure of what's still yet to come. Something that is further complicated by him spotting the big monkey. Right away, he notes how weird it looks and says that it's the first titan that he has ever seen that's covered in fur. And of course, before he can really begin to hypothesize what this abnormal might be, the beast reveals himself to be a shifter by breaking the cardinal rule. He grabs a horse, something that pure titans would never do, as, as far as we know, they literally do not sense any other being aside from humans. Though yeah, Zeke tosses the horse at Mike and it's basically game over for our good old Jojo character. Though what absolutely broke my brain when I first watched the series is that, unlike the rest of the shifters, the Beast Titan is sort of demystified right from the get-go. He approaches Mike and tells the Titans to stop, which is already big clue number one to his abilities of being able to control other Titans. Not only that, he also just straight up asks what ODM gear is, clearly exhibiting intelligence, especially with him not coming off as some dum dum not understanding anything, but being genuinely curious about how it works. Keep in mind that Zeke is very much a researcher at heart. And also, I just absolutely love the shots we get of Mike with the world literally warping around him as Zeke speaks. Because, you know, our guy just came face to face with a new shifter. Another thing to note is that Z casually talks about Mike knowing to strike at the nape, so if it wasn't clear enough, it also reveals that yes, he's another shifter. Though what is easily my favorite part here is Zeke saying, I'm pretty sure we spoke the same language. 
First of all, this is not a throwaway line. It explicitly introduces the notion that whoever these attacking Titan Shifters are, multiple languages do exist in this world, and whoever comes from the outside world has reason to believe that their language may be different. That is exactly how Reiner would notice that Amir is not from parody either. And even in a broader sense, I love when stories incorporate language as a part of storytelling as I feel like it's something that is almost completely forgotten for the sake of simplicity. Like yeah, writing a story where two characters just literally can't communicate because of a language barrier is obviously redundant. But incorporating it in some fashion like we see here or in something like Game of Thrones, I think it adds a really interesting dimension that allows for cheeky moments like Ryan or noticing the foreign text, etc, etc. Though we are still not done with our big monkey, because as Zeke starts walking off just babbling on about the ODM gear, Mike still gets up, very much echoing exactly what he said before. Even now, he never lost the will to fight. Though, Zeke then commands the rest of the Titans to move, and we get what is easily one of the most brutal deaths in the series as Mike is just torn apart. And just like that, the Beast Titan has made his debut and shown that he not only has an immensely powerful ability in seemingly being able to control Titans, but he is also clearly a thinker. A very, very dangerous combo, that's for sure. And the last thing to tackle today is the new ending we get for Season 2, or as it's more commonly known, spoilers for literally the rest of the series. It begins with what we know now to be Ymir making a deal with the Devil of All Things. Considering the fake Ymir we already have in the story and the colossal giants in the Titans, it is pretty clearly drawing on Norse mythology. And considering that in Norse mythology, Midgard, the world of humans, is made out of Ymir, this deal is basically hinting to the origins of Ymir as we know her in the story. Not a girl who made a deal with the devil, but rather a slave who just accidentally came upon the source of all living things, unlocked the power of the Titans, and became an eternal slave to King Fritz, the symbolic devil in this tale. The next shots we get of a titanic figure being attacked by men who appear to be struck down by lightning also pretty clearly evoke Zeke's scream and transforming Eldians into titans. And of course in a visual sense, it further builds on that old school Nordic type vibe. So again, Ymir's name is definitely eyebrow raise worthy and something that would only become relevant with the shots we'll get to in a second. Also, if you go frame by frame, you can see the can of herring that would expose Ymir as the outsider, while also introducing the concept of canning food in the universe. Keep in mind that within the walls, we are basically operating with a medieval setting. We cannot can food. So yes, this is very much saying, there is someone out there with far more advanced technology. And later, we'd of course also learn that it is herring, something that cannot be caught within the walls. But more on that when we get there. If you continue going frame by frame, you will also notice the number 845, the year where the story began and the year Aaron woke up from his long dream. Which, just like I mentioned way, 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 way back in the first video in the series, reinforces the concept of the passage of time playing a very important role, as for Aaron, that would be his loop. If you continue going frame by frame, and yes, this is a bit of a stretch, but you also see what looks like the bottom of a tree if you were looking up, as in what Aaron saw waking up in the year 845. We then see Rose, Mari, and Cena inheriting Amir's Titans, something we would only ever see in the final season. If you continue going frame by frame, you will also notice a whole bunch of shots of Marley in writing, that is then interspersed with almost research note-like depictions of bugs. Which to me says that these are meant to be research notes from Tom Xaver, the previous Beast Titan who worked in biology. Then there are shots of Titans emerging from the water and attacking a coastal town. But uh, Parody doesn't have coastal towns. Detailing the outside world is strictly illegal, and our entire mission leading up to Season 3 was literally reaching the sea. So this is either the original Titan War or some other location we are currently unaware of. Then there's also the shot of a whole bunch of what look to be civilians trying to escape Titans and holding up a baby to try to protect it. Here, I think you could take it to be symbolism for Zeke and how the Eldia Restorationists hope for him to be their savior. Though, they eventually all get captured and turn into Titans themselves, depicted by the Titans attacking them here. There's also shots of what looks to be a Marley attack on a different nation, with it being overtaken by pure Titans with the Colossal lumbering above all the buildings. Later in the series, we'd hear stories of exactly this. Marley would capture entire nations by simply turning civilians into pure titans and then launching an assault. And then of course, the money shots. Dozens of lumbering titans flattening the earth or, you know, straight up the rumbling. If you keep going frame by frame from the rumbling, you'll also notice a whole bunch of shots of the church and the wall religion. 
very much implying that they knew of all of this and this is the dark underbelly of what they've been praying for. With Nick's face literally being shrouded in complete darkness as we see the Titans marching on. So again, very much our Ragnarok events. We also see hundreds and hundreds of people all heading toward the sun, which I think is King Fritz moving the Eldians to parody in the first place. Something that is only further corroborated by the shot of Amir with a horn, symbolizing her wiping their memories. Also in the Amir shot, you can see all nine of the Titan Shifters. There's also the shots of those same flowers, which we've seen many times before, so I won't rehash that again. And of course, the obligatory bird flying in freedom, just like Aaron would eventually see himself. So yes, very much showing us the past, the present, and the future. Almost as if to tell us that all of this is one big time loop, huh? And with that, that is episode 26, or the first episode of season 2. Another big one, and trust me when I say, I think there's like 20 more minutes you could spend on the ending alone. Like, I didn't even mention the fact that the song itself is just so eerie that it straight up sends chills down my spine every single time I hear it. And then you combine that with all the very spooky visuals, and then the lyrics of a bird in a cage and being next to you every day, because, you know, Ymir is within Aaron at all times. And the song itself is also called Bird at Dusk, while the lyrics talk about a morning. So, you know, those shots of the rumbling sure seem like the dusk, and then 8.45 sure seems like the morning, huh? It still blows my mind that it was ever allowed to air and that it flew right over my head for such a long time. But anyway, now it's full steam ahead to the Titans clashing arc and what is, in my opinion at least, still one of, like, top three Attack on Titan episodes in the big wall sequence. So, I hope to see you back then as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. Super excited to be jumping into Season 2 and not talk about Erwin's 300 IQ place for once, because you know, the whole thing takes place during like two days. It is definitely a wild season, but it'll be a ton of fun. Anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.